Thanks, Aaron. Uh, hi, everybody. Thanks so much for, uh, for joining tonight. Um, as Aaron said, um, you know, this is just part of a series of webinars I'm doing right now. Um, a lot of people just write me and ask questions, and I thought this would be a good format just to you know, help people that are in the classroom and really whatever's kind of on your mind. I don't have a specific topic or agenda uh, for tonight, um, but I'll talk the whole time if, if you want me to. And um, if you have used the chat button, if I say something and you have uh, additional information or you have follow-up questions, just go ahead and put those on there and then Erin will relay those to me and she can unmute you if you want to um, also answer. Because I know there's a lot of people here who have experience and, um, you know, I might not answer something fully or you might have something to add, so please, um, please do so. Um, I'd also like to introduce uh, Charlie Myers. Um, I asked Charlie to join us uh, this evening. Um, Charlie has been, um, Charlie can introduce himself in a little bit about what, what he's done, but the reason I asked him here is I know some people are coming on with questions about using the, um, the review sets that um, I've developed in, in their classrooms. And um, I've used them in grades nine through 12, um, but a few, about maybe it's three years ago now, um, two and a half years ago, Charlie wrote me and we started talking and I shared them with him and he's been implementing them ever since. And um, I've got to visit his school and he really has some unique ways of using them and a lot of experience um, with the kids. And so um, I've asked him to just um, share a little bit with us tonight about how he uses them and his implementation um, because we find that um, teachers use them differently. It just really depends on what your needs are. And um, I just wanted to tap into some of his experience tonight um, to share that with you all. Um, plus whatever else, um, he's an amazing teacher. And so whatever else he wants to share, I just thought it'd be better to have more, uh, more heads on this call than just one. So um, Charlie, do you want to add anything to that or? Yeah, I just want to make sure everyone can hear me. Um, I can hear you. I was having a hard time logging in. So, okay, everyone good? Yep. Okay. Sounds, um, like, sounds like everybody can hear you and I'm already seeing some chat questions coming up about the review sets and how you use them, Charlie. Okay. Um, yeah, so I mean, we're pretty excited about the work that we've been doing with Mike's review sets. We've um, been using them now for three years and we have um, really developed them in the way that um, we have multiple levels. Of, so we have about 50 students in the, each one of our occupations. So we have about 150 students in our farm school, um, seventh through ninth grade. And we use Mike's pre, um, you know, beginning assessment to really evaluate where the kids would fit in. And then we've also um, corresponded that with our MAPS data. And then we put the students into groups. And what we're doing with them currently is each one of the review packets um, holds about three key lessons. And so what we do is we present one of those lessons. Um, and then two days later, usually it's about two days, sometimes maybe three, depending on the group, but um, we'll then present the next topic. And after each topic that we give them, we have a certain degree of follow-up that we're expecting from the students to do. And it's usually tied in nicely with the last page of the packet because it's a, it's kind of a review. It's a, it's a review for the test. And as we're moving forward with the packets, what we um, experience with our students is that there's definitely a real engagement. So there's a group engagement that we're seeing with them. Um, we have also, our math team is over the last two years, we have focused on creating, um, it's really designed for accommodations, but um, student generated notes for every single lesson. So, and they're already pre-made. And so we pass those notes out to the students and they're kind of a guide for how we go about teaching the lesson. And the lessons are usually right out of Mike's album. Um, and so what we're what we're seeing is tremendous growth in our program for our students really being engaged in math and so usually a packet will take depending on the group it can last two weeks to possibly three weeks um, how we approach a packet um, and we usually have an off um, you know one of our math um, groups where we won't meet regarding the math packet, but we'll be implementing um, 
like either you know a project that's associated with one of the concepts or further in-depth study will in, will also incorporate seminar um, into the process and I'm not sure I mean there's a lot of other details that kind of go in with it but um, we're having a tremendous amount of success and I think the packets serve us really well because we can actually adjust the packets to accommodate for our students depending on where they are um, and then we're because we're developing our note system our student generated notes um, we have students that are actually taking that and going above and beyond on their own and then they're seeking us out when they need further lessons or further support so we're having a lot of success with it we're very excited about it so we'd be more than happy to talk more about it so. thanks charlie um I, I have a question um because <laughs> one thing one thing that i always worry about is you know we're trying to have montessori classrooms where students are engaged and they're you know um, learning from first principles and having materials and I'm always afraid that people are going to look at those reviews and just see like a list of worksheets and then it just turns into like well here's your worksheets and it's that's the exact opposite of what I want to have happen I want I designed those originally so students could be more engaged in projects this is kind of just like is you know make sure the kids get their skills in and I know you've corresponded that to some of the lessons that I have in the algebra book and from the you know even from the elementary album um, some of the lessons there. So I just wanted to wonder if you could speak a little bit to to that, just to make maybe make me feel better, but also also other people, you know, if they have those, they just feel like, oh great, I thought I was doing Montessori and Mike says to do like just worksheets and that's not the message I'm trying to do. And I know you don't do that, but if you could talk a little bit about how that how that works. Yeah, I, I think it's just one of the things that I think is really important to point out. Um, you know, math is like learning a language. Um, it's, it's like developing the skills that you would get in in Spanish or German. And it's really a recursive practice. So for the students to really develop, they have to constantly see the materials or the work. And what's really nice about the packets is the work is continuous. So even though they move on to a new packet and they have certain concepts in it, um, in the new packet, they're still seeing concepts from the old packet. Um, and that is brilliant. So our, our students are actually loving the ability that some of the questions can be actually quite a few oftentimes can be very challenging. Um, and it's making them kind of think a little bit beyond of, you know, beyond the normal context of the actual first lesson. And so the students are very engaged in that. Um, the material piece, so we, we do try and introduce a lot of the materials um, along with the lessons that we give. Um, and, and I, you know, I do think there's certain adolescents who will hone in and use some of the materials and other of them, they're just like, they'll get the concept and they're just ready to move on. So, you know, that's an area where we're trying to explore a little bit more about how to have the materials more, you know, accessible to where they can access them. but but we are just kind of experiencing a lot of kids, they just want to move on. They just want to, you know, and what's great is that even though they're moving on, it's still recursive. Um, so I think the recursive piece is just huge um, in the design of, of the packets. Um, because I think in a given packet, you know, students will have a wide range of topics um, and lessons that they have to go back and actually you know, oftentimes they just work in groups and they're processing, okay, what was the topic on this one, whether, you know, um, whatever, you know, the concept might be, but um, I don't know, we're having really good success with them. It's, it, you know, it's definitely something we want to continue to move forward with and use. Um, we're also trying to like figure out projects that are associated with how we can incorporate not only the packets, but then projects that kind of speak to the adolescent associated with their occupation work that we're doing, but it's kind of a different topic. We've had a couple of questions come in, um, moving um, a little bit um, off of the reviews for a moment. Um, just a question in general about math seminar. Um, and um, the question is basically like, you know, 
you know, what's a good way to have math seminar fit? Um, or, or how am I saying this? Like, basically, in other classes, seminar seems to be an easier fit, but in math, it has seemed to be a little bit trickier. Yeah, so um, I do math seminar. Oh, go ahead, Charlie. Yeah. No, go ahead. Go ahead. Oh, okay. I, say that I, I do math seminar a couple different ways. Um, one way is through through books and through articles. So if you can find something that, so one book that we read, and again, I've done this mainly with a uh, like, little bit the older adolescents, so like ninth graders, um, we read like Flatland, um, which is a geometry book, but also a um, little bit of social commentary. And so we would we read that. Um, there's also other articles. Sometimes there's like short little chapters of, of, of books um, that are just like interesting um, topics of mathematics. And so we'll do those as a seminar. Um, they're usually shorter um, rather than like an entire, an entire book. The other way that we use math seminar, and I'll, I'll share my screen here, is, um, is that what I'll do is I'll give students um, um, a few questions to work on for the week or for the day or whatever. And then we'll have a discussion based on those questions. And um, usually I'll pick maybe three, four, or maybe five questions, but usually about four questions. And um, the best questions are the kind that can be answered from multiple different ways, um, where students can have a lot of different ways to approach the questions. So um, let me share my screen here. And yeah. so can you all see that? Um, yep. Yeah. So basically what um, the directions for seminar are, um, answer the question to the best of your ability, but to show all um, your work and ideas. Because we want to have the students having discussion about the, the process of mathematics, about the problem solving, about what they're trying and what they're thinking. Because it's one thing to teach skills, but it's a, but it's a totally different thing to teach how do you think. So here's a question that you've never seen before. Um, which of the 50 skills that I know can I apply to this question? Um, and a lot of times students... Um, are afraid to write things down. They always want to get the answer, and they don't. If they don't know how to do the problem immediately, then they don't want to try anything. They don't really understand that yet. So, I tell them they can draw pictures, check and guess, just try down anything and write down their thoughts. And um, they just have to have something written down. So, here are um, three questions that would come from a seminar. So, the first question is, how many two-digit whole numbers contain no zero and no more than one one? So you know, some kids just start making a list. So they're like, well, um, two digit numbers will start with 10. And so um, if it doesn't contain a zero, that eliminates 10. And 11 has two ones, that eliminates 11. So then you would have 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19. Then you skip 20. And then you go 21, 22, and so on. So the kids have all these different ways of coming up with how they'd solve that. Um, some kids list them all out. Others see some patterns. Others just th just think about it. And I had one kid who did this where he thought of the numbers in a like a like a ten by ten grid, like the numbers one through a hundred. And he realized all the numbers you want to eliminate are like on the outside of the grid. So he saw it as a geometry problem and just calculated the the numbers from that. So just uh, so when the kids we come to seminar um, for question number one, we'll read the question. And the first thing I'll ask the students is I'll say, when you first saw this question, what did you think? What were some things that you tried that, that didn't work? And then I'll say, what were some of the methods that you used to do this? So I'm not asking them what the answer is. I'm asking them to think about what they thought about it and to share their ideas. Um, and so as students say, well, I made a list or I drew a picture, here's what I tried. Then the discussion starts coming to, well, what did you do with that? And they start to explain their reasoning. Um, and through that process then, as a group, they, um, share their processes, they kind of learn from each other, and by the end, they say, they, they, they do come to an answer. Um, and then when we're done, I'll say, are you ready to move on? And the kids will always say, they'll say, well, is that the answer? Is the answer 80? Or is it, is it 81? And I'm, and I'm like, well, if, if you don't know the answer, then you should keep talking about it. And I never give them the answer, because I want them to go through the process and them to be confident to know when they really understand it and why. Um, this way, they don't have the reliance on me, the teacher. Um, and what we find is that as students get more and more comfortable with this process um, and they learn how to discuss and ask each other questions and explain things um, in ways which is very difficult for students to do often. Um, a lot of times, especially the kids who know things very quickly, um, they can see how to do it, but they can't really tell others how to do it. So the seminar allows students to slow down a little bit and try to explain their reasoning in ways that can make sense to other students. So 
as students go through this process, um, what we see happen is that in the classroom itself, when I'm not available and kids are doing group work, um, they start to have these conversations. They know how to ask each other questions. They know how to think through a problem. Um, and so that's really um, a very powerful mm -hmm. thing to have happen um, as students get more, more confident and do more questions like this. So um, when I was doing middle school, I would do seminar. Um, I try to do it once a week. We do it like on, on Friday um, and maybe spend about a half an hour or 40 minutes doing seminar. Um, I try to do it at least every two weeks. Um, sometimes I would do it every other week. Um, I think if you do it more than that, then I'm sorry, less often than every two weeks, then it doesn't really become regular and students don't get into the flow of, flow of that. Um, and the questions I just get from um, a variety of resources, some of them I just make up. I find I have puzzle books. Um, Phillips Exeter Academy um, does their entire school through sem the seminar process. They don't have textbooks. Um, but they have a list of questions, and all those questions are available for free online. Um, at, it's probably phillipsexeteracademy.edu. Um, you can just type it in. But they have you know, tons of questions, and you can just pick ones from there that, um, that you like, that you think would work well with your students. Um, and I could talk a lot more about seminar, but that's, this is like the math seminar as opposed to a reading seminar in math. And I have no idea if that was the actual question that anybody cared about, but I decided to talk about it. Anyway, so <laughs> um, yeah, so I can answer more questions about that. And, and uh, Charlie, I, I think you've done seminar um, before in the classroom. Um, if you want to add anything, or if others have done seminar and want to want to jump in as well. Yeah, I, I think from our perspective, what we've kind of been going through an evolution of seminars. So I think we were trying to find things that were like extensions of the concepts in the review packets. Um, and we weren't having the kind of success with seminar that we wanted um, initially. But then what we started to do is we started to pull the more challenging problems that mm. the group was actually struggling to solve in the packets. Um, and then the students were really starting to respond to that because they could actually see and they could process it together and then they could actually see how maybe another student was going about it and another and it's the same very similar to Mike like we we try really hard not to just give them the answers we're always trying like okay how do how do you think we can go about solving it um, and you know we try and get them to identify the things that they can you know quickly see in a, in a problem and and try and eliminate the information that's not necessary. So we're more about the process than really the answer. Um, and so we've been having some success, but we still are in the process of trying to develop our seminar um, mm -hmm. you know, approach as well. The other thing that we, that Mike inspired us on, um, and I'm trying to, I think it was a, a video on ratios that you shared with us at one of the, uh, trainings and it was by a musical group who was doing a video and it was all sequenced. Oh yeah, um, okay go, yeah. Yeah, and um, so like we've been trying to incorporate more things like that which are really speaking to the adolescent because they, that's Well, we lost you Charlie. Can't hear you, Charlie. Just at the very end there. While we're waiting for him to come back on, do you think you could just pause for a second and uh, and tell it and back up to that OK Go music video? What? What was that for? So yeah, so um, OK Go is a musical group, and they're really they have decent music, but they're really known for their great videos, um, and they really try to do a lot with. Um, just really like cool visual effects and and um, they just do all kinds of crazy things with like science and music and and, and everything so um, a couple of their videos they have these behind the scenes of, of how they make these videos so one was um, I'm not sure I showed a couple of them but the one was they tried to do a whole video like in zero G so what they did was they were in an airplane and they would have the airplane like dive you know go up and then on the way down they were in zero G and then they would do they lip sync to the song and they have to get back in their seats and they had to do like eight of these um, to make it work. But in order to do that, 
they had to like sing it like a slower pace and they had, to, had to divide up the song into those sections and then figure out like the, the ratio of the, how to slow the music down so it would fit perfectly with what they were doing. Um, and they have several different videos that, that, that where they show all that really cool math behind it. They have another one where the entire video, the entire song I think is like four seconds. Like the song is like three minutes, but they shoot this, like all these things are happening and it's so quickly, it takes four seconds. And then they do it in super, super, super slow motion. And all these little things are synced exactly with the music. And so like, how did they time all that? So they have these things that fall and they explode like on the beats um, in, in, so it's like, well, how do they figure out the gravity and how did they, you know, it's just like so cool to see how all these different things from science and math and music all come together to make just something that's really just entertaining. Um, you know, you wouldn't think that you would be using math to make this music video, um, but you really do. And so it's, it's, it's pretty cool. And you can just check out, um, you know, their videos. And I think the more recent ones, especially, they've gotten a lot more sophisticated. I'm trying to outdo themselves with the science and the, and the math and the stuff. So it's, it's pretty sweet. Well, and that was a comment, um, we, what you're touching on, that was a comment um, that came through earlier um, about how um, the, the way to t tie in the math program into all the other areas. So Tony had mentioned that the humanities, occupations, microeconomies, um, and that's interesting that you bring up mm -hmm. music videos there. Yeah, and that's part of the reason why I wanted to do the review. So in my classroom, I was feeling like I mean, we were doing projects within math that did connect to other areas. So we do a, a math project that showed how math relates to science or how it relates to humanities. But I felt like students weren't doing as authentic work as they should have um, been doing. And so what I really had a vision of was almost like two math classes happening. One which is like pure math where you kind of learn skills and you do math kind of for math's sake, which can be really exciting and awesome. But then the application of math is happening within the other classes. So... Um, you know, so when students are, so in humanities class, that's where like a lot of our statistics and data analysis can come in. Um, so in other words, before, like I would teach a lesson on statistics in my math class and say, oh, here's how it applies to humanities. And kids are like, okay, well, that's great. And I, they could do a little project. But I think what's more effective is for them to be working on something in the humanities class and trying to do an analysis to figure out, um, you know, po if population density, you know, has a cause and effect with, with the outbreak of this, um, of this disease that came out, and students can then collect this data in their humanities class. But as a math teacher, I can step in and say, well, let's talk about how we correspond those. Here's different graphs that you can use. Here's different ways to analyze whether this is a significant outcome or not. So um, my mentor, John McNamara, would call it um, just-in-time learning instead of just-in-case learning. Mm -hmm. So instead of me teaching something, say, well, here's, you need to learn all these stats just in case one day you have to use these. It's more like, hey, I have a real problem that I'm just trying to solve right now. Now teach me the math right at the, just at the right time. Um, and so, you know, that's something that we try to do a lot in the humanities classes. Um, of course, science, there's all kinds of natural tie-ins. And in, in John's class, um, he teaches both math and science. And he does them, um, and health class. He does them, like, all simultaneously. So the kids basically have, like, three-hour work cycles where they're doing projects and getting lessons in both math and science. And so um, when I've observed his class, you walk in and you don't know, um, they're doing an experiment and they're collecting data and they're doing graphs. So it's like, wait a minute, is this a math project that they're doing um, to learn about slope? Or is this a science project and they're using, they're discovering slope to analyze the ratios of the science. And so you can't really tell the difference between those, between what's happening. And to me, that's just a beautiful way to, um, integrate the math and the science. Mm -hmm. And then um, you also mentioned the microeconomy and, you know, so much again there goes with, um, you know, just like keeping books and um, charting your profit and loss. And, um, you know, I always do a thing with, with the kids like at the school where they're trying to figure out how much to charge for a certain thing. And so, you know, if you charge too little, you're not going to, you can sell a lot, but you're not going to make much profit. If you charge too much, you're not going to sell very much, but those you do sell, you're going to make quite a bit of money. So there's a sweet spot in there. And if you do a graph, it'll be a parabola of your, you know, of your, of your thing. So you sell a little, it's like you have a concert and you, and you know, you sell all your tickets for a penny, you're going to sell out, but you're going to make this much profit. And if you sell your tickets for $20,000, you're going to sell a couple of them and you're going to make like 40,000 in profit. But if you sell them for like $10, then you'll make more profit, but sell less tickets. So you get this really nice graph. And so students can do work with like parabolas 
not even really knowing what a parabola is, but just being introduced to it, the idea through the graph and through the work. And then later we can do a further analysis um, as students have more questions. But um, yeah, so I think that's the best way for projects to come out. And I always like to have my students like always working on a project. So they're always working on projects and they're also always doing some math support skills in geometry and algebra um, to help build up those skills either as they're using them as Charlie said, or because we're studying a math concept and we're seeing how these things relate together and we're understanding, um, understanding a whole idea. Okay, well, yeah, yeah. Okay. I, I think that was great. I don't know if, um, if Charlie, if you're back on, if you wanted to go back and, and finish what you were saying to us from before. Yeah, yeah. sorry, sorry about that. That's my okay. phone's connected to Bluetooth and the car took off with my phone. So. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah, I, you know, I, I, again, I think we're just, you know, we're still in the process of, of really trying to define, you know, how we're using seminar, but, but I, I do think like we're trying to find ways that really speak to the adolescent um, and, and find topics that really engage them in the work at hand. And so we are trying really hard just as Mike just said too, with our microeconomy, to find ways to inspire them. So, you know, we've created, in addition to kind of support the work, like we've created like economic life projects that really speak to the adolescents so they can find their, like, you know, have them research, you know, the cost of living and, you know, what it means to have a car or a cell phone and all those products. And we're able to tie that in with some of our lessons. So, um, we, you know, I, I think part of our, our process is we're trying to find a balance of, of how much um, data review work do we do, because um, we do a lot with the daily reviews that's really driving our math program, um, but we're also trying to find that balance of, like I said, uh, incorporating projects. and. Um, and I'm excited about that work, but that's why I'm really excited about joining this webinar and other conversations we continue to, to help. Yeah, and, yeah, and that's the same boat I was in too, Charlie, where it's like, okay, before I had the reviews, we had, you know, we had work, but again, I felt like the kids need to be more engaged in project work, you know, and really doing things that are meaningful to them. I wanted them to have more choice in what they were doing. And it's so hard when you look at the things you have to cover in a year and you're, you know, for like their if they have state tests coming up or whatever, and you're like, well, those projects all sound really fun and good, but they don't meet the things that I know I'm responsible for, for teaching those kids. And it's, mm -hmm. I felt it was hard for me to make those choices sometimes. And I felt like, well, if this is a Montessori school and we're supposed to be, you know, like how do I balance the student's freedom and choice and their interest along with my responsibility to get them their skills. And so, <coughs> pardon me. Um, that's the, that was my idea of the reviews is that if the kids can do those kind of for homework and for skill work, um, you know, during class, then I could bring in whatever projects I wanted to at any time. And at the end of the year, as long as they finished those reviews, I know that they got the skills that they needed. Um, but then they were still free to do projects um, within the math class. And then I was also free to do more work with them, you know, integrating things into their other classes. So that was really, um, you know, my, my driving force behind creating those was to really to get to get more project work, because I really had a hard time you know, with our, with our, the way our school was, you know, we didn't have a lot of the classes naturally integrated together. The kids didn't have a lot of blocks of time to work to really get into projects. So we had like a separate science class and a separate math class and, a, you know, everything was kind of separated. And I was just trying to find more ways to get them involved in, in, in things that were bigger than just those small chunks of things. So um, that, that's, yeah, so it sounds like we're on the same page with uh, the ideas behind that. So um, while we wait for some more questions to come in, I'm just wondering, you know, this is just kind of stuff for my own edification, um, but the, uh, we, this has come up before, Mike, in conversations with us about like differentiated classrooms, like I, how exactly do you work with your, with the review sets when you've got students that are at, you know, some are further ahead and then some still need more review or, you know, more, I don't know, one-on-one -on -one teaching, like how do you manage that within the review set? Sure. I'll answer how I did it. Then I, I want to hear Charlie's answer and see, because I think there's different ways to do it. Um, I always had mixed age groups, so I would have at least like two, a two year spread um, in the class. And so generally I would have 
but kids, you know, they, they want to have their individual tracks, but they also kind of want to work together. So the kids kind of naturally, in my case, kind of gravitate or I would help them find groups that were kind of appropriate. So for example, I might have a group of kids at the beginning of integrated math one, another group like halfway through integrated math one, another group at the beginning of integrated math two, and another group like halfway through integrated math two. So I would have like kind of four groups of kids working um, this way they could work together. Um, and then I would have like flexible, like I wouldn't say you have to finish it all like at the end of the two weeks, but I would give them kind of a flexible time to work on it where I'd expect everybody to finish. Um, so the kids who need a little more time could have more time within that. Um, I would also not have every kid do like every problem. So if kids needed, um, you know, I would, I could pick out which problems would work best for some kids and, you know, really tailor it to what individual students would need. Um, but also because students were also doing projects, if they finished the reviews early and they kind of wanted to wait, they, they would have more, more project time. So it's kind of like, it's hard because you want them to be able to go at their own pace. But then I've also had it before where, you know, if I have kids, if I have 50 kids in 50 different places, then I can't really serve their needs. I can't really give them the lessons and give them the attention they need. So it's kind of finding where they should be, giving them a group so they have that, that support. Um, letting them move at their own pace within that. Um, and then kids, of course, could jump groups. You know, if kids are doing more work, then they can go and do, you know, um, kind of, I'm not saying move up, but, you know, they could, they could accelerate faster if kids are more, in, more independent. Um, so I guess as part of that, it's just more of a, of a me managing things in the classroom. But as much as possible, um, you know, I would try to allow students to, um, to really be at their challenge level. And if they weren't, if it was too difficult, we'd talk about why and try to fi find solutions that work for that individual student. And if it was, same thing if it, was too, if it was too easy. If they weren't being challenged, then we'd find ways to, uh, to challenge them there. And you know, Charlie, I know you probably have some ways on how to manage that too. I just, um, I wanna um, make sure that I'm responding to the questions that come up and not just my questions. So I'm just gonna jump to um, what Tony just wrote. And, um, and you can feel free, Tony, to unmute yourself and you can say it yourself if you'd like. Um, that's up to you, but um, sure, sure. Hi. So, <clears throat> um, we're actually. I, I, I'm sort of always. I work with Chris Marks, who I think you know quite well, Mike. Yeah, and, yeah. My, and Chris, I love the guy, and he's very much a purist. And so I'm always feeling the pressure of giving the kids the pure math, the work. And also, I think more coming from less about teaching the math and more about inspiring a real love and passion as a community for mathematics. And so that there's really, really deep engagement for all of the time. They're with me for an hour and a half, twice a week. Chris does the math seminar, so that's a different thing. And they love that okay. as well. But we've got a really, really good attitude and spirit and uh, ambiance around the math work. And so that's been exciting. And we've, it's taken year, a couple of years to build that up. And our kids that are leaving are doing ridiculously well, which in some ways protects us from the parents because you're always trying to work again with, you know, swaging the, that madness. So, um, um, so what I, what I, my question is, Chris is pushing back and saying, we're doing too much pure mathematics, even though the kids love it. And I think he's right. And so what I'm trying to do a little bit these days is look at, you know, they're doing climate science as a humanities project right now. They're doing Aboriginal studies. How can I take everything that they're doing, whether it's art, music, science, whatever, and sort of build in as much of the curriculum as possible without, and teach, you know, the discrete lessons in, okay, we're going to look at ratios or we're going to look at percentages because we're looking at this aspect of science and we're looking at how different atoms find their weight and what you know what i mean right there's so much mm -hmm. math is in everything so how do we how do we what would be montessori's what i asked was what's montessori's pure vision if we didn't have state huh. tests if we didn't have all of that stuff what would be the ideal <laughs> so you understand what i'm yeah. getting at right no, if we weren't what stressing out around universities and what their needs are Yeah. So to me, like one of my, and I have this list of like, you know, progression of a math program and like my ultimate level is where 
you know, everything is, all the math is fully integrated in, in all the subjects and the students are all at their own individual paths and, and learning, you know, at their own, at their own, at their own rate. Um, that would be the ideal, I think, where the students are generating questions about life. Um, they're, they're actually engaged in work. So the idea is that, like, when, so when I was doing my training, um, I think it said that you, you trained in, in Bergamo as, as well. Um, I don't know if you remember giving lessons with Mrs. Grazzini, but, uh, you know, um, she would, if I was giving a lesson and I'd say something like, you know, put the triangle to the left for me, she'd ding the little bell. And the bell was for saying, you're doing it for me. You know, the students aren't doing math for the teacher. They should never be doing an assignment because I'm giving it to them. Or, you know, here's the, here's the paper you asked me for. Um, ideally, the math should be coming out of their work. It's almost like, please don't bother me, teacher. I have work I need to do. I have th real things I need to accomplish today. And you can, you're, you're free to help me with what I need, but leave me alone and let me get to work. So the idea is, you know, um, kids come in, they have problems to solve. They have, they have things to do. If they're doing the microeconomy, they're not doing it for the school. They're doing it because it's their work. That is something they're genuinely interested in. They have a mission and they're going to do it to the best of their ability. And then as the adult, we can help guide that to help them deepen and strengthen the things that they're interested in. The other role of the adult then is to inspire because a lot of times kids don't even know what's out there. Um, you know, they have no idea that they might be interested in physics if they've never come across it themselves or that they might never notice the beauty in this piece of art and how symmetrical it is and all the math that goes behind it if we don't introduce them to that. So I think part of our job is to be the introducer of these things to inspire them. And then once the students get in and they start doing their own authentic work, then we're there to support them with all the tools that, that they need. To me, that would be that would be the ideal, um, and of course, as you said, you know, the challenge then is, well, will they hit all the state standards? Will we be preparing them for what they need in life? And I think if we prepare the classroom, you know, in a very general way, and we're kind of clever about how we do things, I think we can get a whole heck of a lot of that in. Um, and I found that we that you can get a lot of that of the the math that you would need for state standards or whatever in through authentic work that students are generally interested in. Um, and there is a time for just pure mathematics. I mean, you know, you say, well, you should be interested in science and you should be interested in art. Well, you should also be interested in math. Like that's a thing to be interested in in itself. And I think for some things that's appropriate, um, you know, because you can't fit everything in there. But I mean, I just find like the Fibonacci numbers just beautiful for themselves, even if they don't have anything to do with, and they do have everything to do with nature and music and everything else. But there's things that are just so cool just for math for its own sake. Um, that I think we should share those with the students as just part of the, the love of life and the love of learning. Um, I, I one just, thing I use a lot in my classroom. Yeah, go ahead. No, I just Sorry, I agree I with you. It's funny <laughs> because I, I'm an elementary teacher initially. And so my okay. instinct is always to tell stories, whether that's history, whether that's Leonardo. If you talk about the golden mean and, and Fibonacci, you can do a whole thing on Leonardo da Vinci. And, and I agree with you. Uh, or, the, or if you're doing decimal system, you can talk about the French Revolution and, and decapitate, you know, and, and you know what I mean? Like they just yep. they love that stuff and it takes them to. And so that I, I care less about the math. I also and I think I, I know this from you. It's like I, I always say to the kids, I love the kid that gets it wrong because then they're learning something. Like if you've already got it right, I can't help you. I love it right. when you get it wrong. Please try. And I know that's John McNamara always uses that stuff. And, I, and that's what I love. Yep. Yeah. And this, um, I'm going to share this real quick here. You know, you mentioned the stories and I was going to say that, you know, I have the, the, this math timeline, um, get this out of the way here, you know, in, in my classroom. And so whenever we have, um, you know, whenever we're starting off a new topic or we're, you know, I'm always telling the stories of the people that were behind this and why would anybody want to learn trigonometry? And we, I mean, I don't say it's trigonometry, but we talk about how would you measure the distance of the stars? And did anybody ever think about that? And how did they do this, you know, a thousand years ago? And so we talk about the stories and who the people were. And um, the kids really, really get into that. Um, they'll ask me to tell the stories year after year. They just, they just love hearing, you know, how so many people died tragically. And I hate to say, I mean, it's kind of a little macabre, but kids are like, you know, like, why did this happen? You know, it's like, it's very dramatic. Um, and I think a lot of people find math can be very dry and boring, but when you start telling the stories that are behind it and start sharing 
um, the story of humanity, really, and how this changed the world and how they were influenced by the world around them. Um, I think that can be really powerful. And, you know, I know all my kids that leave are not going to become mathematicians. You know, I, I know that. I know a lot of the kids aren't going to really use math every day. But, but that doesn't mean that they shouldn't have a love and appreciation for all those things. Um, just like, you know, I don't, I'm not an art teacher. I don't need art, but I'm sure happy it's in my life. You know, I want to be able to appreciate those things around me. Um, and I think that um, kids should be able to appreciate mathematics in that same way. So I think there's a mathematics for all. We can do mathematics for everybody in this kind of general love of life and love of learning way while simultaneously preparing them for skills that they may need to go into math related fields, to go to, to go to university, to do all those things that, um, that they, that they want to do. So Mike, I'm going to stop now because I'm going to get too excited. And I know, gonna... but, but that, that timeline is so fun. Can you please show the other one that like, we're, uh, what do you guys call it? Um, the movable, movable. Movable? Yeah, I can show that. Can you show that yep. one? That's like so cool. I love that one. Yeah. Yeah, so this is a different version. These have the same people on it, but they're organized um, like more like a traditional timeline where these years are actually evenly spaced. And so you get a different impression of where the people were in history. Um, and like the traditional Montessori timelines, there's a lot of white space because there's a lot of people who are not on this timeline and things that happen that we don't um, know about. Um, and then we develop this one one where it's just blank um so students can fill it in on their own and then we provide um just all the all the people that are on there but the idea is that students can you know we can you can do a study of certain people if you want maybe a certain culture place them on the timeline and then the students can um create their own pictures create their own you know, if they wanted to look at how science was related to mathematics or how history comes in, they can kind of start to build their own timelines and see how um, math interrelates with the, the bigger story of humanity. Would you use this so, in elementary as well? Um, I think it could be used in elementary. Um, I mean, I've used it in my adolescent classroom, so I've never used it in an elementary classroom. But, um, well, we have elementary teachers. What, what, what do you think, Tony? What do you think, Charlie? Um, how, how appropriate would this be for an elementary classroom? Well, I, if, I, if I look at the developmental needs of that child who's interested in, in uh, the stories that go on and, and, and I mean, we all the mute timelines that we have the same kind of opportunities with early humans or whatever, I think it's, it would be wonderful. And it would be, I mean, I find all the materials bridge and you can't get too caught in, oh, this is ready for this. Yes, they, they approach it from a different mindset, but mm -hmm. I mean, we all look at this as adults and go, oh, I wouldn't mind learning about all that. Like, <laughs> you never get bored of these kind of graphics and visual, um, I mean, visual graphs are what are, <laughs> make Facebook work. I mean, it's... Yeah, one of the things we did on, on our end is we had students before they actually came to our farm school, so they're transitioning from sixth to seventh, is, is we wanted them to just spend some time over the summer and research mathematicians. And so then when they came in, then we had these posters and we were able to like, hey, this is where the person you researched fell in. Um, and then we also tied it in with a world um, geography map. And so where they were all located. Um, and, and so I, I think for the elementary, I think it would be, one of the things that we had done in the past, and of course I haven't done this in, with the adolescents yet, but is to tie it in with the history question charts. Because um, I think there's a real benefit there for to have guiding questions for them to actually use to actually research some of these mathematicians. And, and I, I will also say the other thing that has worked really well on these charts is for the students who really love math, um, they just soak it up. So they love to, just, hey, they didn't even know that person existed. So they, it's a visual for them to experience someone. And then, um, and then it's really interesting because it brings out our history lovers. Um, and again, they are, you know, finding their back door into discovery. Hey, this person, you know, discovered this concept in math. And so that's been exciting for them. But I would definitely, you know, foster in the elementary as well. So. Cool. So we have about 10 minutes left. Are there any other um, questions? Whoops, am I muted? No. 
No, you're good. I okay. hear you. Are there any other questions uh, for Mike? Anything um, or for Charlie? Anything um, specific to the review sets or specific to um, algebra or any I, general questions? Go ahead. Well, I did want to comment um, on Tony was talking a little bit about um, ago about how to really inspire this work in the students and whether it's through project work or if it's or if it's just the content behind the concepts and one of the things that um, I had a really profound success with um, last year and I've been doing it again this year is I would actually give my really advanced students the entire printed list of all the concepts um, that were actually going to be in all the review packets and what I did is I, I passed those out to my advanced groups and, and I asked them to decide together as a group who was going to teach what lesson. So then they went through and they just broke them out um, between them who was going to teach them and they did all the research on how to teach it. And if they needed help, then I would meet with them and I would even show them some of the pages in Mike's album and I would let them read those and I would encourage them to look for other resources on the topic and one of our underlying themes was to really try and figure out where this mathematics applies in real life and so that was like one of the carrots they always had to come back to with the lesson and I mean it was probably the most profound my experience of teaching in a lot of years of just watching this group teach themselves I mean they would meet they would they, you know, I even foster times where, hey, you guys want to go to a coffee shop and just sit and, and just talk about math. And they're like, yeah, let's do it. So I, mean, I, I think the more we can get ourselves out of the equation and put them in it and have them be in control of it, um, it, it, was, it was just, I can't even brag enough about it. It was just really inspiring for me as, as an adult to just watch them teach each other. And, um, and they really loved knowing, okay, these are all skills that are building for me, not, I mean, they didn't quite maybe understand where they were all gonna fall into eventually, but but they knew that they were working towards something really special, really inspired. So I would definitely recommend doing that for some of your advanced kids. Uh, I think um, that we have a quote, which is, um, a good math teacher takes themselves out of the equation. I think that, uh, I think you're right. I think that works. Mm -hmm. yeah. Anything else you want to share, Mike? No, I think that's that's awesome. And you know, one of the things that you know, you know, Tony said, you know, removing yourself. I think that's one of the things that materials can do is if you show them how to use them, um, and then you can step back and let the materials just teach the students. So you know, with the algebra tiles and the factoring, like I could show them, I basically show them, and somebody mentioned about like how, um, I think Kat said it would be great to use these, um, the timeline as part of the, the great lessons. And what's funny is like, I kind of break up the algebra into six different areas and for each one I have like a story. So it's like, I have like six great stories of algebra and like six great stories of geometry. So I've actually thought about that and I want to get those, you know, grouped together for people. I think it's really cool to start off that way. Um, so when I start doing the factoring, we start telling the story of, of Euclid and al khwarizmi and kind of this development of why, what algebra was and how and why they did it the way that they did. And they started off geometrically. And we talk about the historical reasons for that. And so when I give the students the materials, it's no longer like saying, well, you aren't smart enough to figure it out the real way. So here's some materials that you have to use. It's more like, well, this is how Euclid and how al khwarizmi did it. See if you can figure out what they were trying to do and why. And how can you work this in different ways? And so once I show them how the materials physically work, then pretty much they can go through and do all these different variations and learn all this factoring um, very independently of me. Um, and just kind of, and as Charlie said, they, they teach each other. They, they learn from the materials themselves. They work together. Um, and it's really great to see that happen. So I think the materials are also a, a great teacher. Um, and then the seminar helps helped me with kind of creating what Charlie's talking about, where students learn how to talk with each other. They learn how to teach each other. Um, they learn how to explain and how to think through tough questions because, you know, so often um, in a traditional math class, you know, the teacher goes up and they, they do a problem in three easy steps and that's how you should do it. 
if you take any longer than three steps or any more time, then that means you're not good at math. And I think, you know, we try to, Montessori tries to put the, the process first and the idea that, that formulas are a point of arrival, that you're discovered, it's a process of discovery. And as the work gets more, more complex, I don't think that we have to take away that we don't have to lose that discovery approach at all. I think the discovery approach is in, in a way even, even more important for those kids. Um, and we just need to give them the time and we need to have the structure that allows them to work together, allows them to do that discovery. Um, and it can be a beautiful thing to see them just, just work on math and get excited about it, especially kids who never might, who, who never thought they would when they first start off. So that's pretty cool. Question from, from Garrett. I'm sorry to, so I'll cut you off, Mike. Yep. And so, Garrett, do you want do you want me to read your question, or do you want to ask it yourself? Uh, you can read it. Okay. Um, okay so <laughs> Garrett says for some of his older students, like the fifteen plus year olds, um, they're mm -hmm. preparing for the SATs online, and when they hit a problem they don't understand, they're to write down the question and the answers, and these become the basis of a lesson that they work together. They work with together. And it's separate from the lessons in the MAA book. So is that okay for him, for them to be doing? The students seem to be very interested in the lessons, just wants to make sure he's not off track. No, um, I would do that all the time, actually. Um, you know, because my classroom is not preparing them specifically for the SAT or the ACT, I mean, I'm aware of what those topics are. Um, but oftentimes, you know, especially if students are kind of going at their own pace and they're kind of, you know, working their way through the curriculum as, as they need to, there'll be concepts that they haven't seen before. Um, and so our, our school was structured where they would have like lessons in the morning and then the afternoon would be more open work time. And so students would always be free to, they'd say, hey, Mike, can I come by in the afternoon and bring my SAT book and work through some questions? And so they would bring the book in and they would have a list of things and we just work through them. Um, and sometimes those would be just kind of quick answers. And other times I'd say, oh, actually, you need this lesson. <laughs> and then I would grab a lesson from the book um, and kind of teach that if I thought it was going to be more, more important. So no, um, but especially when the kids get older, they bring their questions in. Um, they form study groups. Sometimes they would form study groups in the afternoon, and then I would just come in and help them with their questions. So um, no, it, it's totally appropriate um, to do that, I, I feel. Okay, we have just a few more minutes if anyone has any other um, questions. On, yeah. on that note, we, we use, I often use, here in Canada, we have Waterloo University is a well-known, very high academic math university. And they've, they have created this series of what, we, what are called either Gauss tests for the younger kids, Pascal te te tests. Yeah, I don't have, you get the sense. We, I sometimes will go through a couple weeks and just let the, or at different times of the year, and there are a series of word problems or math problems, and the kids, like, they love them because they're well constructed. And what I do is I let them work on their own, and they solve them together, and, they, and it, it shows me the whole, it's almost like so much better than a standardized test or anything else because the holes, the problems, you know, the holes that individuals have appear and then they get the support of each other and as you know when you when a child explains it to another kid that's where deepest learning happens and so but I, I you know they love that they love pure math and lessons they love working on the stuff that is part, like how do you balance on that how long should math classes be and how often a week i know those are all questions but <laughs> I, you don't understand like yeah. i want to know that like, i'm looking for some shape i guess no, I, I know. Um, that is the question, right? I mean, math needs to be five days a week for four and a half hours a day. And we didn't know. <laughs> that's how I feel, though, you know, and I have this list and I do some workshops on helping teachers design their classes, you know, and I wish I could. And, and it depends so much on your circumstances. You can't just say this is the way to do it, I believe. Um, okay. It depends on how many students you have and, and what's the rest of your schedule like and how many adults do you have. And what are their passions and what are your passions? You know, I mean, I think you have a lot of things to balance. I mean, there, there's math seminar, there's materials, there's individual work, there's, there's review work, there's, integrate, there's integrated work, and there's math history. And, you know, there's just so much to do. And I think that, I mean, you have to find a balance that works well for you and your kids. I don't think, you know, if the kids are engaged in what they're doing and you're exposing them to all, at least a little bit of everything, 
then I think to me, then that, that, that's a good job. You know, if you were, if the kids were really engaged, for example, in, um, and just doing that pure math, but you said, well, they're engaged in that. I'm never going to do any math history with them. To me, I think that's not, that wouldn't be fair. But if the kids are getting a little bit of that, but they just have, you have to have a group who just loves doing the math history, but they're still exposed to things or they're really into seminar and they're really doing that. Then I say, just go with it. I think that's part of the freedom that we have. I don't think there's a right or wrong way to organize it. I just think they need to be exposed to different kids need to be exposed to different aspects of the math classroom um, at different times. So I think we, we give that availability and we look for that engagement. Um, and so I don't, I, it's kind of hard to go wrong when oh, they're I should tell all, Chris five hours a day, every day. Five, yeah. Math should never end. Okay. That, that's really what it is. I know. So You're right. It's uh, like everything. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, I can't hear you, Aaron. Oh, sorry. Okay. I'm unmuted now. All right. I think that that is, uh, that's our hour. So we, um, we should really wrap up. We have another um, free webinar with Mike on Monday. Um, Mike is doing four workshops this summer and well, three this summer and one in October. And, um, and he's launching a geometry book. So the geometry book will be, um, you know, the follow-up album to the algebra book. So um, keep checking things out with Mike at greatwork.com. And uh, we've got a lot of good stuff going on. Greatwork.org. Yeah. Charlie, thanks so much for joining. I think that was so helpful um, with your experience and what you've been doing with the kids. Really appreciate oh, it. Oh, thank you for asking me. And thank you for all your wisdom and everyone. It was great. Cool. Yes. Yeah. And thanks for everybody for joining tonight. I hope it was helpful. And if you have ideas for further webinars, like I said, we're going to do a couple more of these open formats, but if um, there's a form you can fill out on the great work website, where if you're like, Hey, can you do a webinar on blank? You know, um, and if there's interest, then I'll, I'll start doing more, more targeted ones. Um, and I can always find experts that are in the field still working like Charlie, or you know, there's a lot of other great mathematicians who could have join us um, to give their wisdom and um, we'll just keep it going. So thank you so much, everybody. I really appreciate it.